Welcome to this uh, call open. No? It's very nice to see all of you here today. And we have a really special guest today. His name is Raj Gopal, no? And he's a very well known name in the physics of uh, ion collisions. And in particular, he's a uh, who's it? Um, <laughs> uh, to a pioneer, a pioneer <laughs> of effective theory for uh, ion collision, which is called Cortas Commonsense, which he will mention today. And his name is related directly to many things about the Commission, not only CPC. He has done many beautiful works on the early stage of the conditions. He has done a lot of works related to the phenomenology of the conditions. And recently, he is broadening his interest also to things which are not directly in the conditions, but still related, as he will explain today, to QCD in some sense. I think we met personally in Japan for the first time, right in, yes. in Kyoto. And uh, since then, we met another few times in some uh, conference, also came to BNL once. And uh, yeah, he's an extremely nice guy. You will see uh, while he gives his talk, he's extremely nice. And she has a very nice style of presentation also. So I'm sure that you will enjoy everything that will come up from the all of you. So, of course, as usual, this is a very friendly and informal environment. So, you feel free to ask any question that you want, both during the presentation and also at the end of the presentation. Okay. In particular, questions from the students or from the young researchers are very well uh, appreciated. Okay. Okay. So, let's give a warm welcome to Raghu. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So, Laura, <laughs> it's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in in Catania and Sicily. I've only been to Sicily once before to on the wrong side to Erice, and so now I'm on the other side and to Palermo, and now I'm on the right side to Catania and uh, the area. So. Uh, it's my first time here, so it's a great pleasure. Um, so, um, yeah, and thanks to Marco for this very kind introduction. Um, I hope uh, my title uh, intrigued you a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I guess uh, it's the first time I use the elephant in the title. And um, and so what's shown here is, uh, you know, is an elephant that's being harassed by a swarm of bees. Uh, I don't know what's the word for bees in Italian. Uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so there's a swarm of bees. And uh, in, in fact, um, you know, elephants are terrified of bees, even though they're very small and the elephants are very big. And so uh, clearly this is meant as a metaphor um, because, um, in fact, what people in many parts of the world do where there are lots of elephants, uh, the elephants cause a lot of damage because they trample on crops. And so how do you deal with that? So people came up with this ingenious idea that you put beehives on fences and that way the bees prevent the, the elephants from going into farmland and, and destroying all the crops. But this became such a popular idea. It's a win-win that uh, people even market the honey that's sold from, from such beehives. And so you can actually go online and try to buy the elephant honey if you want to feel good about yourselves. Um, and uh, actually, if you look for this, it's completely sold out. So don't try this today on the internet. But anyway, so um, the idea is that, you know, the uh, behind this metaphor is that there's a very big problem in, in the standard model of physics. Um, and the it's the elephant in the room, so it's a metaphor. Uh, but the idea is that maybe sometimes little things can cause some insight into this very big problem, like the bees harassing the elephant and causing the elephant to react. Um, and maybe that's a way to kind of understand more about this big problem. And that's the theme of my talk here. And and the problem is stated here, and it's a it's stated by a couple of mathematicians uh, and, and it's um, 
you know, and like a lot of mathematicians, they're very precise in how they formulate problems. And the problem in 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 just a in a in a colloquial language is called confinement. That, and I'll explain as I go along in my, in my talk. Uh, a, a simple realization of the the statement, this mathematical statement here. But let me just read it out, where it says, "Proof for any compact simple gauge group." So this could be some non-abelian gauge group. Uh, a non-trivial quantum Yang-Mills theory exists on R4, that's our real world, and has a mass gap. The existence including establishing blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it's some very formal problem. And basically, you know, it's the idea that is at the heart of our standard model of physics. Okay, so this is the biggest problem in theoretical physics. And there's a million dollars if you solve this problem. So this is one of the clay millennial prize problems, and this is its formal statement. So if any of you, the young people in the room, were to solve this problem and show mathematically that this is the case, then you will get you know, a big prize and uh, you will be celebrating. But th this is the essential, the biggest problem in, 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 in theoretical physics that we know. So I want to kind of not give you a mathematical introduction to the problem, but kind of a more um, perhaps more philosophical or, or kind of um, heuristic uh, understanding of what it is. And I'm going to formulate it as, as a play in four acts. Okay, so the, so the first act of the play is the essential mystery of this big problem, which is called confinement. So it's a confinement of quarks and gluons. And I'll explain what that is. And then I will discuss what we know about the problem. So, right, when there's a problem, you've learned over 50 years or so what the problem is and, and, and uh, what some of the advances are in understanding it. And then I will, in the third act, discuss what we would like to know, right? So what is missing? What, what are the elements that uh, we would like to know more about? And then the final step, we'll come back to the we partons that I mentioned, the the, the swarm of bees that will give us possibly some further insight into this outstanding problem and how we can get there. So let me start with the first act, which is the glue that binds us all. So what do I mean? So if you probably somewhere in this department, there might be a poster which has all these fundamental uh, particles, right? So these are the force carriers, the standard model which are the quarks and the leptons, and then there are the, the force exchangers, which are the gauge bosons. Um, and what the particle I'm going to be talking about is the gluon. Okay? Uh, and uh, of course, it's the, it's, the, it's the force carrier of the strong interaction. So we have, of course, the four forces, the gravity, uh, the uh, electromagnetic, weak and strong forces. Um, and the gluon is a force carrier of the strong force, and it's complementary to the photon, which is how I can see you. Uh, and then there are, of course, the Z and W bosons, which are which uh, transmit radioactivity. Um, and the gluon, so uh, is is perhaps not as well known as the Higgs. So the Higgs boson is something that people have, there's a lot of press about, and people uh, call it the God particle. Uh, but the gluon is, is, I'm going to argue to you, is equally profound and in some ways not fully understood. And like the photon, it has zero mass, zero charge, and it's a spin one particle, but has features which are really completely different from that of the photon. Um, and so why is it relevant? And here's a cosmic koan, okay, like a little, like a little phrase. Right, which says, and that's the philosophical part, which is that. So, if you think about the mass of the proton, right, that's about um, ten to ten to the minus uh, twenty-four grams. Okay, so it's uh, it's very heavy compared to the masses of the quarks. So you have up and down quarks, which make up the proton, and so if you add up their masses. It's about 100 times less than the mass of the proton. So this is 1.78. This is 168. And so where does the mass of the proton come from? Right? So that's, uh, that's something that we would like to know because we are made up of protons and neutrons. So the mystery of how we are made up is fundamentally this problem of how the mass of the proton is made up of. What is it made up of? So, so if you think about this problem, gluons are massless, like I mentioned. 
And the up and down quarks are almost massless. They have 100 the mass of the proton. Yet somehow the dynamics of these quarks and gluons is responsible for the mass of the proton and therefore for nearly all the mass of visible matter in the universe. Okay, so that's a deeply profound problem. Now the Higgs particle, in contrast, is only responsible for the masses of the quarks. It's not responsible for the mass of the proton. So somehow it's the interacting dynamics of quarks and gluons which generates the mass of the proton. In fact, some people get really upset if you say God particle, because you know it's really not true. It's really the mass of the particle is really coming from uh, from the dynamics of quarks and gluons, not from the Higgs boson. And in a, in a actually, and and somewhat uh, amusingly, um, when Higgs was searching for uh, his Higgs particle in, in the in his in his uh, serendipitous discovery of of the Higgs boson, he was really not looking for you know, what we understand the Higgs boson to do, uh, he was really trying to explain the strong force in nature. Okay? In fact, in a splendid irony, actually, the Higgs boson is really produced predominantly through the collisions of gluons in, say, the Large Hadron Collider. So you have two protons collide, and you have two gluons when the two protons come together, and they form the Higgs boson, which then decays into a variety of different channels which you can then from which you can extract that the Higgs was actually produced in nature but but it was really the the dynamics of the gluons that really led to the creation of the Higgs so um so what yeah so what do gluons do okay that's different from say photons as I alluded to earlier so think about a problem where you have two quarks that scatter of each other so you can think of say two electrons in in electrodynamics and when two electrons scatter, they can exchange a virtual photon, which carries a force between two electrons. So that's our quantum theory of electromagnetism. And so these virtual photons can go into a quark, uh, electron positron pair. And then these are all the quantum effects, which quantum electrodynamics allows us to calculate with high precision. Now, gluons are different because from photons because unlike photons, they can self-interact. So a gluon, virtual gluon, which is you know, not on shell, can fluctuate into a pair of gluons. And those pair of gluons can recombine and then continue to exchange the force with, with the quark. And photons cannot do that, right? So in fact, the very fact that I can see you is telling you that the photons don't interact to first approximation. Uh, and so this is something that's absolutely unique about the strong force that's not there in electromagnetism. And this self-interaction has a very profound effect, which is called asymptotic freedom. And when you include the, the self-interactions of the gluons, what it does is it flips the sign of the force between these quarks. And what you find is that the interaction strength, which is given by alpha of Q, which is the strength of the scattering between quarks, becomes weaker and weaker as you probe the scattering with shorter and shorter distances. So large Q by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle means short distances. Large Q is momentum transfer, and that's inversely proportional to distance. So going to large Q is like going to small distances. So when you have two quarks scatter, the closer they are, the more weakly they interact with each other. The further apart, they interact more strongly. While in, in electrodynamics, we know it's not it's the opposite, right? When two electrons are very close to each other, they, they repel each other very strongly. Or if it's an electron and a positron, they attract each other very strongly at short distances. While with, with quarks, it's completely the opposite. And that's what is revealed from decades of experiments, which show that for very different momentum resolutions, the interaction strength lies on this curve. And so what you see is that they get asymptotically, this is a logarithmic plot, but as you get to shorter and shorter distances, the force gets logarithmically weaker and weaker, and that's what's called asymptotic freedom. And this was really, an absolutely earth-shaking discovery, which completely changed the nature of our understanding of the universe. And I don't mean that lightly. I mean literally changed our understanding of the universe. Uh, before 
asymptotic freedom, our universe at early times was considered to be this very opaque object you could never learn something about. But the fact that the interactions get weaker as you go to shorter and shorter distances, let us be able to probe further back in the universe and learn more about it. I'll talk about that later. So essentially the self-interaction, so it's this humble self-interaction gluons that is really responsible not only for our existence, but for our understanding of the universe as it exists. Uh, and this is really therefore justly uh, responsible for the Nobel Prize to Gross, uh, Pulitzer, and Wilczek. Now, now, in this quark quark scattering example, I mentioned briefly that the, this, the force between two quarks gets weaker at shorter distances. At larger distances, the opposite happens. They become more and more strongly interacting. That's again the opposite of ultradynamics. If you think of two charges, electric charges at large distances, they don't interact very strongly. However, with quarks, they become more and more strongly interacting. And that's reflected in this plot here. So this is an actual simulation of, of the theory of the strong interactions, where you take two heavy quarks and you try to pull them apart. And these are the force fields that are generated between the two heavy quarks. And it's like pulling apart a rubber band. So at short distances, things are weakly interacting, but then the tension grows until at a distance of one Fermi, which is 10 to the minus 15 meters, the quarks experience a force of 16 ton weight between them. Okay, so these are absolutely tiny, tiny objects, which are 10 to the minus 19 Fermi or so smaller in size. Uh, they're extremely, they really point like objects and the force between them is 16 tons at a distance of 10 to the minus 15 meter. And this is sometimes called uh, the opposite of asymptotic freedom, it's called infrared slavery. So as you go to larger distances, quarks remain bound. You cannot separate two quarks from each other. And that's reflected in this potential between these two quarks as a function of distance uh, normalized with some scale. And at very short distances, the force between these heavy quarks uh, satisfies a Coulomb potential here. So this is the Coulomb force, right? It goes as one over R. But then at large distances, this force grows linearly, okay? And that's what's reflected in this, you know, very strong force between these two guys. And at some points, it becomes so large that these, the rubber band breaks apart and then the quarks pick up other quarks from the vacuum and they, they, they actually become colorless. So there's a color force that's between these two quarks that, that is extremely strong and it grows linearly with distance. Um, so what are some of the consequences of this? And this understanding of very simple picture of quarks very weakly interacting at short distances and strongly interacting as you pull them apart allows us to understand the whole plethora of subatomic particles that we have discovered uh, in, in nature and organize them in some systematic way. And one of the earliest such indications of this actually preceded our current theory of the strong interactions that I'll talk about. Uh, and they were called chu frotchi plots. And so they were so-called Rege trajectories uh, after Tullio Rege from Torino. And so if you plotted the masses of these subatomic particles against their angular momenta, which are given here with their spin parity designations, uh, you saw that these objects, these subatomic particles, so these are like different subatomic particles of different masses, they lay on these straight line trajectories. And uh, similarly, a different set here also as a function of, of in the plot of mass versus uh, angular momentum. And you could understand this plot literally in the picture of some rigid ro rotator. So if you thought that these two quarks formed a very strongly interacting rubber band, right? It was very stiff. And then this rubber band could rotate with some velocity. And you could understand all these subatomic particles, these mesons that are shown here, as kind of living on some as being a rigid rotator with all the, these being excitations of this rigid rotator, which different angular momenta. And in fact, this picture works extremely well. So if you say that the mass goes as some uh, object here called um, the rigid trajectory, so this is a slope, 
of this relation, J versus M squared. Uh, and this object sigma is the string tension between the quark anti quark pair. And if you look at all the mesons and you extract the string tension, you find that this the, the values that you extract just from experiments, it's roughly the same magnitude, just from this extremely simple picture. And, and uh, what is also uh, very interesting is that the stringy picture of hadrons was actually led to what we now understand as modern string theory. So in fact, Gabriele Venziano, uh, his famous 1968 paper, was really trying to understand the spectrum of hadron resonances. And that's what, you know, is led to him being the father of string theory uh, and the, all the developments in that direction. So it was really understanding the strong interactions more deeply that led to modern string theory um, more than 50 years ago. So let me summarize this act, right? So nearly all of visible matter is made up of quarks and gluons. So we are all made up fundamentally. So if you take all of us and you break us down into our smallest indivisible parts, we are quarks and gluons. And so that's really truly fundamental, right? So, but we can never see quarks and gluons, okay? So they are confined within us and they're confined into objects which are called mesons or baryons. So mesons are quark anti quark pairs, which are bound, and baryons are three quark states, which are bound. And there are more complicated combinations that are possible, but th this accounts for the bulk of matter that we know. Now, the fact that they are confined is not a bug of the standard model, it's a feature. So the fact that you cannot see quarks is not a problem, but it's, it's a feature of the strong interaction. And that's what is confinement. And so all strongly interacting matter, right? all the phenomena that we see in the strong interactions uh, is an emergent consequence of this many body dynamics of quarks and gluons. So there's a very complicated dance of quarks and gluons. And a very simple example that I gave you earlier is that the mass of the proton comes from this dance of quarks and gluons. It's the energy of the quarks and gluons, which is bound together, which gives you the mass of the proton. And that comes from massless gluons and nearly massless quarks. And as I showed you from these two Frotchi plots and the radio trajectories, there's an elegance and simplicity to nature's strong force that we don't fully understand. I think maybe my, my phone is probably what's causing uh, the interference. So understanding the origins of visible matter demands that we develop a deep and varied knowledge of this emergent dynamics. So it's OK. I think it's my phone probably that's causing the problem. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so that's the essential mystery. So in, let me remind you at the start of the talk, I give a very mathematical formulation of this big problem, which is a million dollar, literally a million dollar problem. And this is kind of an intuitive kind of heuristic um, but perhaps equally powerful way of thinking about it. So we have a theory of the strong interactions, and it's a correct theory. And and as of last year, it was 50 years old, okay? and it's called uh, quantum chromodynamics. And uh, as uh, any Jesuit will tell you, it's the power and the glory that that of quantum chromodynamics that that is. Uh, really remarkable, and uh, that owes to these different people. And I had the honor of attending the a conference on the 50th anniversary of QCD. And this is David Gross after my talk at this conference at uh, UCLA last year. So that was really quite a fantastic conference. Um, and it goes back to these papers by Fritz Gelman Leutwiller and also Gross Vilcek, as I mentioned, who discovered asymptotic freedom. So, um, how so QCD is an, and I'm going to talk about QCD for the rest of this talk and it's an absolutely beautiful and profound theory and it's the most beautiful theory known to uh, us human beings and I will explain in a minute why but the way it came about was not beautiful or simple uh, it was in the same way that a very ugly pupae of a caterpillar grows into a beautiful butterfly and there's a very nice lepidopteral metaphor uh, where, uh, which was given by Jeffrey Mandula at the retirement fest of one of my colleagues, Mike Kreutz, who did a lot to develop QCD. And how we started from the ideas of Gelman, 
of saying introducing quarks as mathematical objects to describe all these subatomic uh, mesons and baryons, and how over time it evolved from mathematical concept uh, to this actual theory that I'm going to be talking about quantum chromodynamics of quarks and gluons. Um, and in fact, Gelman, until the very time of the discovery of asymptotic freedom, still thought that quarks were mathematical objects. He wasn't necessarily fully ready to accept that these were actual things that you could really see. So there's a very famous 1972 conference where he still says, well, you know, maybe it's real, but, uh, you know, we still have to keep our options open. Um, so what is quantum chromodynamics? And as I alluded to in my previous slide, that it is a nearly perfect theory. Yeah, uh, of, And it's the fundamental theory of quark and gluon fields, which make all of us up. So QCD is um, that theory. So why is it nearly perfect? Because the theory has almost no parameters. So historically, when people came up with theories, so like describing hydrodynamics, which is a very nice theory, there were lots of parameters. You take data and you build, put in the parameters, and then you fit, you explain something, and then you take more data, and then you take more parameters, and you fit stuff. And so always theories involve lots of parameters. And this is a theory where if you put the masses of the quarks to zero, there are no parameters. So everything is an emergent consequence of the dynamics in the theory. Okay? And that's what makes it nearly perfect. And what spoils it is the Higgs. Right, which gives mass to the quarks. So, so actually, it's the masses of the quarks which kind of ruin this beauty. But it also makes us exist. So it's a mixed feelings that uh, that one has about it. And and the theory is also really beautiful because it's very rich in symmetries. So one of the great uh, developments is of quantum field theory, which is the theory of our world, is that there's a there's a wonderful statement by the Nobel prize winner C.N. Yang, where he said, symmetries dictate interactions. So if you take some set of fields and you impose some symmetries on them, the interactions of those fields emerge from those symmetries. And quantum chromodynamics is extremely rich in symmetries. And I've written these symmetries out in this way here. And just for completeness, let me go through what they are. So one is that it has a color symmetry. So quarks and gluons carry a color charge. So just like electrons uh, and protons carry electromagnetic charge, quarks, in addition to electromagnetic charge, carry a color charge. It's a separate charge. Okay? And so do gluons. Gluons also carry color charge, unlike photons, which carry no charge. And that's this SU3 symmetry. So it's a it's a local symmetry, so at every point in space-time, you have this symmetry, and it's unbroken, but quarks and gluons are confined, so you never see the color, okay? So you never see the color charge, it's confined. And then it has something called chiral symmetry, which is chirality is a Greek word for handedness. So quarks and gluons, if they're mass, massless, can be split into left-handed and right-handed uh, quarks. And so the left-handed quarks just mixed amongst each other, and the right-handed guys mix among each other, and they never would meet. But when you introduce mass, things change dramatically, okay? and that's actually responsible for our existence, is the breaking of the symmetry. So even though there's such a symmetry, it's exact for massless quarks, but it's broken in reality. And similarly, there's the law of conservation of baryon numbers. So when you formulate quarks uh, as a theory of baryons and mesons, each quark carries a baryon number of a third, and that is always conserved. Okay? And similarly, there's an axial charge, which is conserved. The theory is also scale invariant for quark mass. So you can change the scales of the fields for massless quarks, and it's invariant under that. And the theory holds, has also has discrete charge conjugation parity and time reversal symmetries which is also what quantum electrodynamics has. The electricity and magnetism also has such symmetries. Um, and all of these symmetries, okay, except that of color, is broken by the vacuum of, of nature. Okay, so, so quantum chromodynamics was the first theory to tell you that the vacuum, the zero energy state of nature, is a very complex object. Okay, so the vacuum is 
as fundamental as the fields that they interact with. And you cannot separate our understanding of what we think of as nothingness from matter. There's a very profound interplay between the two. And this has radically changed our understanding of nature and of things like the vacuum. So such vacuum quantum effects break all these symmetries and our existence and all the rich phenomena that we encounter are a consequence of the breaking of these symmetries in systematic ways. Okay? So symmetry is very beautiful, right? But it's the breaking of symmetries that create phenomena. Okay? And so inherent in quantum chromodynamics are the deepest aspects of relativistic quantum field theories. So theories which take Einstein's relativity and quantum mechanics and put it together, those are relativistic quantum field theories. And those theories, of these, the most subtle and complex is QCD. There are QCD-like theories, which are also have many of these features, but QCD has confinement of quarks and gluons. It has asymptotic freedom, where quarks get weakly interacting, short distances. It has things like anomalies, all kinds of other very interesting effects that I don't have the time to go into. So you say, OK, you have a theory. Tell me what it does, right? If you can write down a theory, you can solve it, right? That's what we physicists do. And uh, so people thought about this very hard right after QCD uh, was invented. And uh, the person who made the greatest contribution to our understanding of solving QCD, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very non-trivial theory, even though it's a very elegant theory, it's highly complex, as I've said. And so solving theory is not easy. So, so Ken Wilson, who's shown here, and uh, he's holding what is called a telephone, in case some of the younger people may be unfamiliar, and behind him are computers, okay? And so that's what they looked like in those days. And so he, he was uh, trying to solve the theory, so he had this idea that you could put the theory on some kind of a lattice, okay? So which is each space-time point would be a point on this lattice. So in principle, it would be a four-dimensional lattice, right? Because we live in three space and one time dimension. So, uh, and he had this idea that you could solve it by making the time complex. So you would be what is called a Euclidean four-dimensional theory. And then this turned out to be an extremely powerful framework um, for which in part he was awarded the Nobel Prize. He did other important stuff too. And uh, this is an extremely powerful way of understanding QCD and it gives you first principle treatments of the static properties of the theory, the masses of uh, hadrons, the moments, thermodynamics, and so on. And in fact, here's a very nice plot of the masses of different um, mesons and baryons um, uh, as given by QCD in the experiment. So in red are the results from QCD. Um, and what you do is, again, as I said, this theory has no parameters. So what you do is the following. You put the theory on the lattice, and then you fix the parameters of the lattice by giving as input some of the hadron masses. So you give the mass, say, of the kaons and the pions, right, and the, and the cascade baryon. And then the theory spits out the answer with no additional information, okay, on all these other particles. Uh, and this is really quite a remarkable result. So this is in MEVs, so it's 500,000 and so on. Now, the lattice has gone much further beyond. So it can not only give the masses of the hadrons, it can also give you the mass differences. So notice that this scale is on the order of MEVs, while the previous scale was hundreds of MEVs. And so it has a precision now on the order of MEVs, and can tell you the difference between the mass of a proton and a neutron. So a proton and neutron differ by one MeV or so. And the lattice, you can put quantum electrodynamics and QCD on the lattice, solve it together, and recover the mass difference of the proton and the neutron. Okay? And so it can do that for all the other baryons. It can, in fact, it can even predict some of the mass differences. Um, it also, at the LHC, it can predict new mass states. So these are all the mass states in blue that are predicted by lattice QCD here, all the stuff in blue. And some of them are agree with experiment and some are actual predictions. So the lattice actually predicted this resonance, which was discovered at the LHC. Yeah. So it's become now a very strong predictive tool. It also can explain thermodynamics. So if you heat up quarks and gluons, 
right? Or if you heat up hadronic matter, so you take, you know, protons and neutrons and pions and you heat them up, how do the quarks and gluons get released at high temperatures? And is there a phase transition that goes on? And so this is something that can be studied with high precision on the lattice. It can also explain scattering and nuclear reactions and so on. And this really important recent work on beyond the standard model physics, where the lattice is used to compute hadron matrix elements for the G minus two experiment, which uh, if, you have, if you're interested, I can tell you more about it. So, um, so I talked about lattice QCD, but what do we really know about what's going on inside the protons and neutrons and hadrons? And a very and how did Gelman finally accept that quarks were real? Okay, not just mathematical constructions. And that came from experiments where what, and so experiment is always, you know, the ultimate arbiter of our understanding. And this is no exception, where you had an electron at very high energies, which scattered up a proton, and the electron emits a virtual photon. So this is QED, and this virtual photon scatters of stuff inside the proton. Okay, so these would be the quarks, for instance, if they existed. And so there are experiments done at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in the late 60s, where they actually looked at the cross section. So on the y-axis is a cross section, it's called F2, uh, as a function of the momentum of the proton that's carried by one of these objects here. Okay, so, so for example, this quark would be carrying, say, 40% or 60% of the, of the momentum of the proton. And what they found, so these were experiments done by Friedman, Kendall, and Taylor and colleagues. And what they found is that independently of the energy or the resolution with which these quarks were struck, the cross section did not depend on that resolution at all. Okay, so if you looked at shorter and shorter distances, it just acted like they were free quarks. And the, all the curves for different resolutions all lay on one curve. And that was called Bjorkian scaling. So they varied the resolution scale inside the proton. So it's like you're probing something and you're changing the resolution of what you're looking at. And it didn't matter. They all looked exactly the same. And they all lay on one curve. And that was powerful evidence that inside the proton, what you had were point-like objects which were not interacting with each other. So that was shocking because you think of the strong interaction quarks and gluons, they must be strongly interacting. And then you do this experiment and you find that, oh, it's the opposite. They're weakly interacting. Okay. And the answer, of course, was asymptotic freedom that we know, that quarks at short distances are weakly interacting, like I mentioned earlier. But that was a big shock when people did these experiments. Uh, it's hard for us to look back and imagine how striking that was. And so for this, uh, they were awarded the Nobel Prize. And now, just like deep inelastic scattering has gone on steroids, okay? So there were experiments done at the Hadron Electron Ring Accelerator uh, at the DAISY Laboratory in Germany, where they plotted the cross-section now that I showed you earlier as a function of the resolution scale. And remember that I showed this very small window earlier where you saw Bjorkian scaling, and that's this window here. And now there's data, which is several orders of magnitude. So you, you can look at quarks which carry 100,000th of the momentum of the proton. Okay? So that's the, you can study the cross section for hitting such quarks. And this data would then be used in from QCD. We have the so-called factorization theorem where you could construct the parton distributions that this corresponds to and make predictions for jet cross sections. So this is data from Rick, from the Tevatron, and from the Large Hadron Collider. And look at the scales on this data. It goes across 11 orders of magnitude. And so you could take this information on the structure, quark gluon structure of the proton, and have the predictive power to, to compute cross sections across 11 orders of magnitude. And this is all due to the asymptotic freedom of these quarks and gluons that allows you to actually compute such cross sections. Uh, one can even go further and use QCD now as a benchmark for physics beyond the standard model, because QCD has become so precise that we can say, you know, you can look at the production of say W bosons at the LHC and look for new physics signatures. 
And all the QCD calculations which dominate this cross-section, because these are coming from gluons forming the Higgs, which are going to Ws, are now, because of asymptotic freedom, you can compute in perturbation theory with higher and higher precision. So you go, go leading order, next leading order, and so on. And you see that the precision, as shown here, right, for the gluon fusion to Higgs is at extremely high precision. Okay, so it's next to next to leading order. So in powers of the coupling constant, you've gone to power alpha s to the to the fourth. And so uh, as a function of energy here. So so if there's any new physics at the LFC beyond the standard model, then QCD is very crucial to uncovering that physics. OK, so you can say, well, OK, you told us that you have a theory, QCD, of the strong interactions. It you know, explains all the visible mass in the universe. It's made up of quarks and gluons. You show that it works. The lattice confirms that. Perturbation theory confirms asymptotic freedom uh, beautifully. So what's there to do? Are we done? Okay. And so what I'm going to argue to you that is we are quite far from that. There are many, many mysteries that we don't understand. And one of the problems is that even though you can put QCD in the lattice, you can only do it in imaginary time. Okay, So you have to take one of the, the time variable and make it imaginary. And what that does is that it makes the, uh, it, it's what's, so essentially all the temporal dynamics is lost. So you can only understand the ground state properties of the theory or thermodynamics, but you cannot do things like compute transport coefficients, uh, you know, like the viscosity, for example, of quark gluon matter is difficult to compute using this technique. So even though Wilson made this great jump, great achievement, the lattice is really not telling us very much more than some of those things that I mentioned. And how to go beyond that is really an outstanding problem. So for example, if one of you in the back of the room came to me and said, okay, you guys say you have a theory. Okay, it's made up of quarks and gluons. What does a proton look like in terms of these quarks and gluons? Does it look like this, where you have the quarks and there's gluons around them? Or are the gluons clustered around the quarks? Or do they form a kind of Mercedes Benz like this lattice calculation showed us? Uh, and then you could go further and you could say, what if I take the proton and I boost it to high energies? Okay, How do the quark and gluons behave? Do they behave like this? Uh, or do they cluster further? We have absolutely no idea from first principles how that really happens. So even though we have a theory, we claim we understand it, some things we understand absolutely precisely about it, but there are yet very simple questions you could ask that we don't have answers to. And that's not a sign of true understanding when there are such simple questions. Again, to continue with the deep and elastic scattering paradigm where I look at inside the proton at some resolution and, and energy, there's a whole landscape I can draw of the strong interaction. Okay. And so on the y-axis, I have the resolution, so very small distances inside the proton and with decreasing resolution. And on the x-axis, I have the energy with which I'm probing what's going on inside the proton. And that's this momentum fraction, 1 over x, that I mentioned earlier. So here is our great success. We understand that the theory is made up of quarks and gluons. Deep and elastic scattering is very successful, like I showed you. Right? You can make real predictions in perturbation theory. Here's where the lattice tells us that you know how hadrons are formed. We see the mass spectrum very beautifully from the lattice, but then the rest is the wild west. Okay, We don't really understand what happens to these hadrons as you boost them, right? How do the quarks and gluons look inside the hadrons? Uh, that's, and there are ideas like, you know, maybe these are objects called pomerons or regions from, you know, pre-QCD days, which describe the total cross sections. Uh, how do these quarks and gluons form these objects? Okay, uh, And how, is there a condensed matter physics of QCD? So just like in electromagnetism, right, we formed QED, and then we had this whole explosion of condensed matter physics, right? Renormalization group, strongly interacting materials, and so on. What is the comparable thing in QCD, right? So that's this region here where quarks and gluon correlations are becoming important. So how do you understand these correlations of quarks and gluons 
and are there new phases of matter that emerge as a consequence of their interactions? Are there new critical phenomena that are uncovered as you vary these? And finally, there's a regime I'll talk briefly about where you can have very high density of gluons, very strong fields, which can then perhaps give us insight into some of these issues. But the, at the heart of it is this problem of confinement of quarks and gluons that I mentioned, which we don't understand. And that's what's preventing us from going from this region here to understanding the rest of this diagram as shown here. And so that's the problem that we need to solve to really understand the strong interactions. Now, you can see this uh, problem play out in the phase diagram of QCD. So when you are, so on the y-axis is the temperature, on the, on the x-axis is the baryon density, the density of baryons that's made up of quarks and gluons. Uh, and so when you do uh, experiments, so the early universe, right, was an experiment that we are part of. So in the early universe after the Big Bang, the baryon density was very, very small, right? It was one part uh, in, in uh, it's, it's uh, one part in, uh, 10 billion uh, is a ratio of baryons to photons in the early universe. And so the early universe is very low baryon densities. And at some point you had quarks and gluons, and then they condensed to form uh, protons and pions, hadrons. And what, how did that happen? Was there a phase transition that occurred when these guys got bound into uh, hadrons? Uh, and we know from lattice QCD, so that's one of the great triumphs of the lattice QCD, we can compute the crossover temperature from when a gas of quarks and gluons became uh, a soup of pions and protons. Okay, so there was a transition in the early universe when it was very hot, it was quarks and gluons. As the universe cooled, it became, you know, hadrons, so, so mesons and baryons. And we can compute from the lattice that the temperature of this crossover in the early universe was 156.5 plus minus 1.5 MeV. So it's 1% accuracy. And that's about 2 trillion Kelvin. Okay, so the early universe in the quark gluon transition had a temperature which was 100,000 times hotter than the center of the sun. And that's something we can compute very precisely. But this region here is, is terra incognita. So we don't know if as you go higher in baryon density, do neutron stars form? quark stars at sufficiently high density? Is there something like color superconductivity, like in condensed matter physics? Are there novel phases? Are there critical phenomena, critical points, like in, or like in liquid gas and, and, uh, um, and, and so in the, in the vapor, uh, ice and water transition, for example? Um, so are there, is, is there a non-trivial phase diagram that we can explore? So there are experiments going around the world which are really trying to uncover this by colliding ions at different energies, trying to explore this phase diagram. And some of these are shown here. Um, and this is something that still we don't really have a handle on, okay, because we can't solve confinement. Okay? Uh, heavy ion collisions at very high energies, which you may have heard from your colleagues here in Catania, uh, that is, when you collide to ions at very high energies, the quarks and gluons get released, and they form uh, a very strongly interacting soup of quarks and gluons called the quark-gluon plasma. How does that happen? How do the distributions of quarks and gluons inside the nuclei transfer to the momentum, uh, strongly interacting momentum motion of, of quarks and gluons? such that it behaves like a hydrodynamic fluid, as you may have heard. So the experiments indicate the violence of a nuclear collision settles to a nearly perfect fluid, the quark gluon plasma. So imagine that the initial state of the collision is some very far from equilibrium stuff. It goes through some non-equilibrium dynamics and finally settles into uh, thermal equilibrium. And this is what you measure in the experiments, and we want to learn how that happened. So um, people are getting tired, so let me now get to my last act. Okay. Um, so what I talked about was the essential mystery of quarks and gluons, that it's a feature of the strong interaction. It's not a bug. And I talked to you about the great success of the theory in certain regions where we know it's actually the correct theory. And the problem is solving this correct theory. Uh, and I mentioned some of the problems we like to solve, the phase diagram, how matter flows, okay, for instance. So what is... What can we do further? Okay, how can we go further to try and sort of 
understand the elephant in the room. And so these, this is the buzz of we part on. So um, let me indulge your patience and talk a little bit about this because I personally find this part very interesting. So this is going a little bit more of a deep dive into the, the problem. So as I mentioned to you that you have a proton made up of three quarks, and at low energies, you can think of this protons being dressed by all these gluons. So they are gluons which pop in and out of the vacuum and they dress these quarks. And um, <clears throat> you can say, uh, you know, these are virtual excitations. So this is the vacuum that's dressing the quarks through these gluons that are being emitted. Now imagine you take this proton and you boost it to close to the speed of light. What happens is that these gluons live longer and longer and longer, okay, because of Einstein's special relativity. As you boost something, there's time dilation. So all these objects start to live longer and longer. And now if you probe this with an external probe, like a deep inelastic scattering electron, then what the electron is going to see is going to be see the proton as this big collection of quarks and gluons. Where each of these gluons, which has now become real, so this is as real as this proton here with three quarks, but now it contains large numbers of gluons in addition to the quarks. And so each of these gluons then has to carry a very small fraction of the momentum of the, of the proton, right? Because it's not just divided among three quarks. Now it's divided between three quarks and a lot of gluons. So there are lots of small wee gluons. So these are the wee gluons that carry a very small fraction of the momentum of the proton. But that's what a proton looks like at high energies. It fluctuates on a very short time to a large number of gluons. And when you probe it, that's what you see the proton to be. In fact, this is what experiments tell us, okay? So, so some of you may have seen these plots. This is again from Hera in Germany. So this is the distribution of protopartons, so quarks and gluons inside a proton, as a function of the fraction of the energy which is carried by each of these quarks and gluons. And you see that as you go to smaller and smaller fractions, right, as shown by this plot here, which each of these guys carrying a small fraction, the, the number of gluons explodes. So the proton is no longer a simple object at high energies. It's a many body system, just like in condensed matter physics. Okay? It contains tens of gluons, okay? and in a nucleus, even more. And this is, they are interacting very strongly. And this is a strongly interacting system. It's a many body system. And so we have to use many body techniques to understand how these quarks and gluons behave. Yeah. Uh, so what happens with this growth? Okay, so here you're seeing that it's kind of exploding. In fact, if you look here, that the number of gluons is more than 20. I mean, it's like, well, it's it's, it's a two orders of magnitude greater than that of the number of uh, quarks as shown here at high energies. And so what happens, right? So is a proton like a popcorn machine? So do you think of these quarks as as these gluons are producing more and more of these guys? And does the proton explode? Okay, so at some point, can you confine these quarks and gluons inside the proton? So that's really something that's an outstanding question that, that has to do with the stability of matter. Um, and this is an important question because these soft gluons are what really populate the central region of the heavy ion collision. So when you have a heavy ion collision, the gluons, the quarks that are carrying the most of the momentum, they just go off along the light cone. So this is a light cone. So the most energetic quarks go along the light cone and the rest of the stuff is formed here in the center. Okay, and that's what describes this, this iconic plot that you see from the star detector of the quark gluon plasma being reflected in these particle distributions. So the question is, how does this happen, right? How do these quarks and gluons actually form this quark gluon fluid, which then goes into all these particles? And, and the story is that uh, what actually happens is that as you go to very high energies, the reason that the proton doesn't blow up is that as you keep going up in energy at fixed resolution, um, what you find is that you get more and more gluons which are picking up smaller and smaller sizes inside the proton. So it's not like the popcorn kernels are the same size as you're increasing the energy. They're getting smaller and smaller. Okay. So you can pack more and more of those gluons inside the proton without exploding the proton. And that is an emergent scale, which is called the saturation scale. So, so imagine that you have a popcorn thing and then you're producing more and more gluons. And so, so naively you would think, oh, this is going to blow the lid of the proton. 
But what's happening is that you go to high energy, you're producing smaller and smaller, and it's doing it in such a way that the proton is remaining intact. Okay? So nature knows about this phenomenon that you like to produce more and more gluons, but it takes care of it by making them smaller and smaller. And that's an emergence scale. In a theory, which is called a saturation scale. So a probe that's scattering off the proton is going to see the color that's screened on a distance, which is one over this, this screening scale, which is a close backing scale. And this is a phenomenon known as gluon saturation. And there's a theory, as Marco mentioned, the color glass condensate, which describes how these gluons self-interact. It's a very complex many-body problem. And so the, it's called a color glass condensate because the gluons carry color charge. It's a glass because the dynamics of these gluons near the proton is much slower than that of the dynamics which scatters of the, the probe. And so there's a, the time scales are much more dilated. And this matter is a condensate because the large number of gluons, they get close packed into like something like a Bose-Einstein condensate. So it's, it's a gluon condensate that you form at very high energy. So there's a very long series of work on this. And what it actually does is gives us a theory for how these, these nuclei collide in heavy ion collisions. It allows us to compute from first principles how this system evolves from very strongly interacting gluon fields to a hydrodynamic fluid. Okay? And it has very interesting phenomena as it goes along, like turbulent attractors, hydrodynamic attractors, and so on. So if anyone's interested, you can look at this article we wrote for Reviews of Modern Physics, which kind of summarizes our understanding of this field. Um, and uh, you know what's also remarkable is that you can actually calculate how the system very far from equilibrium goes to some kind of turbulent tractor and then goes to thermal equilibrium. And remarkably, you can actually compute the thermalization time of this fluid as one over this close packing scale times some powers of the coupling and the thermalization temperature also in terms of this close packing scale. So the very close packing gluons at very high energies in these nuclei, it gives you the only scale that you really need to know in detail to understand the thermalization times. And in fact, if this close packing scale becomes larger and larger at high energies, the system thermalizes extremely rapidly okay, uh, due to asymptotic freedom. So this, this matter is remarkable because it is really, uh, it is universal to the dynamics of ultra cold atomic gases. So if you, if you take the theory that describes ultra cold atomic gases, which are expanding in a trap, and then you compare the dynamics of that theory to that of the expanding uh, overoccupied core gluon plasma, you find that the two distributions can be mapped to each other exactly with the same critical exponents. Uh, and such sort of self-similar behavior has already been observed in Bose-Einstein condensates, where if you take the behavior of the so-called distributions and Bose-Einstein condensates as function of momentum, and you scale them appropriately, you see that they all lie in the same kind of universal curve, which is exactly the same structure as what forms the cork gluon plasma. So there's an interesting question whether you can use cold atomic gases, which are tabletop experiments to really simulate the dynamics of the cork gluon plasma, which is this very non-trivial object. But this is not solving the elephant in the room, which is how do so if you have this close packing of gluons, which form kind of a black disk, and then you have quarks and gluons here, the still outstanding problem that we haven't solved is how do these quarks and gluons become pions? Okay, we don't understand how they get confined. So we have gained a lot of insight by understanding this close packing region. We can use that to calculate some of the scattering, but we still don't understand how quarks and gluons go into hadrons, pions, and kaons. Um, we have some hope, though, in addition to, to doing um, some of the studies that I mentioned, is that there's a new game in town, and that's the electron ion collider. So it's a $2 billion, $3 billion, it was $2 billion, it's now gone up to $3 billion, uh, which is now being built at my laboratory uh, at Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, it's under construction, and it will be completed in the mid-2030s. And it, what it does is it takes colliding beams. So there used to be this rick tunnel in which you replace one of the rings with an electron ring. Uh, and the electrons 
can be rotated in this ring at energies up to 18 GeV, giga electron volts. Uh, and the protons can be also circulated in this tunnel with energies up to 275 giga electron volts. So this is 275 times the mass of the protons. So it's highly, highly relativistic. And nuclei up to about 100 GeV per nucleon. So the center of mass energies are between 20 to 140 GeV. The most remarkable thing, though, about this machine is that it has luminosities. The brightness of this machine is a thousand times the previous such collider. So in other words, an experiment that would take 10 years to do to get the result could take, you know, a few weeks. Uh, and so in that sense, you can start asking questions about QCD, which are highly, highly differential. You could say, well, if there's a strange quark here, there's an up quark there. You know, and I look at some final state, you know, very cleanly, can I understand what's actually going on on a time scale that I can really construct a theory for, right? And I get a result in a few weeks and so on, which is very, very precise. And so this is going to be the most precise machine to study QCD dynamics. So this big mystery at the heart of the standard model, which is the confining dynamics of QCD, will finally be, have a machine that befits its complexity. And so we can do a huge range of measurements. I don't have the time to go into this. But one of the things I want to mention, you can do an experiment like, for example, you can have an electron come and scatter off a proton, and the proton can exchange some colorless object, which you can then look at jets coming out from the scattering and probe inside what is this, how is this colorless gluon object formed? Okay, so you're really now digging deep into confinement by studying such processes. Uh, and you can learn things like, what is this Pomeron that I mentioned earlier, which describes high energy scattering? What is it in terms of QCD in great detail? You can also ask questions about the spatial distribution. Remember, I was saying we still don't understand how the partons go into pions. So now if you do this experiment at very high energies, and then you look at the transverse spatial distribution, you can do tomography. So you can say, well, if there's a quark here, how is that correlated with a pion over there, for example, right? How does this fragment into a pion? Uh, and so you can really look at the spatial distribution of gluons as a function of distance impact parameter inside a proton. Uh, and this will be complementary to future plans at the LHC. So at LHC, the next frontier in doing heavy ion experiments of starting QCD is this a brand new detector called ELISE 3 that's being built. Uh, and that's going to really probe all this confining dynamics of QCD again with very, very high precision, very soft physics, right? It's the idea is to understand, you know, how again quarks and gluons go into pions in very different uh, setups. And so this electron ion collider and ELISE 3 plus the other LHC experiments are going to be the new frontier for understanding the mystery that's at the heart of all the matter. So thank you very much for your patience. But before I go that, let me just say that on the theory side, we also have some effort on a humble effort. So this, we have something called assignments, collaboration, and confinement and QCD strings. And what is interesting is that the string theorists, so many of these people in here are string theorists, and they have decided that QCD is really a profound and deep problem and that we need to solve it. And so we have formed the Simons Collaboration Confinement QCD Strings. And uh, many of us are trying to kind of understand this, this big problem in sort of bringing new theory tools back from string theory to QCD to try and solve some of these issues. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> At the beginning, you said the end people, so I. <laughs> That's you! <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, maybe you, 
you what first or second slide of act would help in uh, yeah i'm sorry one, yeah okay very good okay yeah so here you say that uh, uh, with this your boost in a way you are able to i don't know if this is the correct sure, word, map your problem to a many body problem so my question may be naive is uh, looking at this picture which i which is actually the, 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 so there is some maybe some peter behind that or something like that and your function so how can you map these virtual rules in a system that is made in my, let's say, three level Antonian with my operators, A, Daniel, whatever, of a real uh, many body system. I don't know if I was uh, clear enough. Yeah, yeah, that. no, absolutely. I mean, it's a very reasonable question. So, as I said, I mean, uh, it's a question of time scales. And so, this is, of course, highly, highly virtual, but is highly virtual compared to what? So on the time scale of the probe, it's highly real. So the probe is seeing this on a time scale where it is actually seeing the dynamics of a many body system as real gluons, right? Even though from the point of view, an observer, which is sitting out in the real world, these are, everything is totally virtual. I just see the final state. But on those time scales, it, it is completely real. The same question could be asked actually at some level about the quark gluon plasma. You say, well, what is the quark gluon plasma? It's, I mean, you say many body system, but it's just some intermediate state and in some collision. All I see at the end is these 2000 particles or 10,000 particles. But on those time scales of interest, you can really map it into actual many body dynamics with separate distinct time scales. So there's things like device screening going on, magnetic screening going on. You can have vortex structures forming, you can have condensation going on. So like this example that I gave of this expanding, uh, it can be mapped onto Bose-Einstein condensates, the Gross-Petersky equation, which normally you think applies to superfluids and much, much longer time scales. But if you adjust for the time scales, you get all the same kind of many body dynamics. Of course, then you have to take that result and then compute a cross section or correlation functions, which is not so different from condensed matter physics as well, or nuclear physics at lower energies. Um, but I, I think um, the essential idea is the separation of time scales uh, from the point of view of the probe of the because so the probe sees it as real, but it's in terribly small time scales. I hope that answers uh, yeah. very good. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good question. Then the other is okay. But, uh, you say that when you go at low X, so you want to become smaller and smaller, you continue to grow, but indeed there is a, a big change in the slope of the growing. Right. right. Yes. What, what is that? Yeah, so so um, that's a very good question. So 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 imagine that uh, the physics is that of Bernstrahlung, which is also in so you produce more and more gluons, but at some point the gluons become so dense that they start to have many body interactions. They recombine, they scatter. Uh, they screen each other, and so, so they are. So at some point, there's a competition between the tendency to produce more gluons and the screening and recombination effects. And so there's a there's a growth factor and there's a there's a recombination type factor. And there's a balance. There's an equilibrium that's reached, which is like a new vacuum. So you start from some vacuum where you have you know all this stuff going on. But then there's a new steady state that's created, which is like a new vacuum. And in that new vacuum, you have this close packing of gluons. And then the distributions don't grow as fast anymore. You've kind of saturated the growth in the distributions at that point because of this competition that's going on. So you're not producing as many gluons. As, and, and a consequence, another way of saying that is that you've saturated unitarity that you the cross section has become so the probability of producing more has no advantage so so suppose you produce n gluons and then the probability goes to one at some point for producing so adding more gluons is not really going to add 
you have, you have to saturate unitarity. So somehow you have to find a way to not violate unitarity. And nature knows this way of doing this close packing of gluons as a way to saturate unitarity, but also not grow the cross section indefinitely. So it's a very con interesting dance that that goes on. Yeah. Yes. So essentially, there's a change in the in the slope of the distribution, and that's described by this emergent scale. So there's only one scale in QCD, which is this lambda QCD. That's a string tension. But this is a scale that, like in many body dynamics, there's new scales that emerge from the underlying scale to the theory. So it's like you're writing down an effective Hamiltonian from the original Hamiltonian. And that effective Hamiltonian is some combination of the scales of the original Hamiltonian. And that's what the saturation scale is. So, I know there's people in the back of the room, so I'm waiting for them to ask uh, questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, referring to part three and to the uh, temperature point, uh, right? Uh, well, for the just next, next. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Just, right. Uh, right. Just that the temperature right, plant, right. I, I suppose that it's yeah. quite a fast process. Uh, it's intended to be a fast process. Right, so what do you and mean by fast? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. if there is a critical region, of right. course, you, at the center stage, you are always fast. And then you, in a phase transition, you create defects. Right. So the other the question is, is that which are the defects in the Low phase. Right. So that's a very good question. So when you um, when when you actually have this transition here at from the early universe, uh, there's actually no phase transition. It's a crossover. So the analogy would be like an electron ion plasma, right? So if you take ions, if you take like a you know a bound state of atoms and you heat up the atoms. They become just separate electrons and and ions, right? And that's there's no phase transition. It's just a it's just a crossover from one description to the other, and that's what happens here. So there's actually no actual phase transition. So the defects, in some sense, are that you form the hadrons. So you have the quarks and gluons, right? And then you form the hadrons, which are the objects, which are right. So the, the defects are more than ones. Yeah, I mean, you can think of it that way. I mean, in the sense that you're, you, you know, this is the final low energy state, right? And you start out with these, you're changing the degrees of freedom. So what you see is that the entropy grows tremendously. So even though there's no actual phase transition in the, in the strict sense of a phase transition, um, that there's no order parameter, you see that the degrees of freedom change dramatically, and there's a huge growth in the entropy. Uh, yeah. Now, the Kibble mechanism is something that would be relevant, say, really close to a critical point, where there you would actually see self-similar defect formation. So it's um, it is, and and there's no critical point in this region here. It's just a pure crossover. Yes. Yes, so there may be. So we don't really know the answer to that. So in fact, this is one of the big questions in the field is can experiments see evidence for something like a critical point? And if indeed there's a critical point, then there could be a kibble direct kind of mechanism that's going on. In fact, I have a paper with that in the title <laughs> where we actually look at, you know, the sort of the critical slowing down that goes on near the critical point and then there's a quench then there's a competition between time scales and the system is frustrated and develops these structures but uh, here there's no such quench dynamics that's going on in the same way um, it's just a crossover but there's a huge rise in the entropy there's a, a sorry a huge decrease in the entropy the entropy is is very large here Right, but then it's 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 then combined into these quarks and these hadrons.
entropy density, what entropy. Yeah. Oh, you had a question about G minus two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, minus two was the discussion because I think it was Palmer that uh, uh, said that the lattice QCD is in disagreement with the calculation that are done, let's say, uh, linearly. I think there uh, the main problem is the wrong contribution, right? The one, the one that you don't know exactly how to calculate if you go. Uh, really, yeah. in the perturbative regime, you are more precise than lattice QCD. Right. But really, now with lattice QCD, you can be sure you have those precision. Because yeah. So, um, is is that a board? No. no. Okay. So, because I was I was thinking something I could draw which would show this uh, very clearly. Um, <laughs> trust me. Uh, uh, there's no chalk, right? So, uh, so so. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So basically, G minus two is so you have a muon that's kind of processing, right, as it goes in some magnetic field, and G minus two is the the spin precession of the muon. And the idea is that there are virtual quantum loops that the muon experiences, and those quantum loops affect the value of its precession. So it's like a top that's processing. And the precession of that top depends on its interaction with the vacuum, which is all these virtual particles. Now, what Vincenzo was saying was that at some point, these photons can go not just into electron positrons, but it can go into a pair of quarks. And then those pair of quarks is then sensitive to QCD. So to understand the full precession of muon G minus two, you have to understand QCD. And that's the confining physics of these quarks and gluons. And so people had, are now trying to calculate that part of the G minus two, because some of it is just QED, where you can calculate this, the, the electron positron loops and so on to high orders. But then at some point, the quark contributions becomes as big as the electromagnetic QED contributions. Um, and so there's a big controversy because there are experiments that were done at Brookhaven and Fermilab which gave an answer for what the precession of these G minus two is. And the whole goal is to find beyond the standard model physics. Suppose there are particles that are not in the standard model, can virtual loops of those particles affect the precession of the muon, right? That's the goal. If you, there's a disagreement between the standard model and the experiment, it tells you that there's new physics waiting to be discovered beyond the standard model corresponding to those loops of those particles. Now, lattice QCD, there are two sets of calculations of lattice QCD. Uh, one is by the group of Fodor and collaborators that you mentioned. And then there's another group, which is called the Lattice QCD Consortium. It's a very big consortium of people. And they use different techniques to calculate the hadronic matrix elements. The Lattice QCD Consortium takes input from data at different experiments. They take dispersion relations and so on. So they take some input from data and they combine it with the lattice calculations to make the prediction. While Fordor's calculation is a pure lattice calculation, it doesn't include the data input. Now, there's a disagreement between the two. And the reason the disagreement so was is that the, the data changed. So there were experiments done in Russia and that we're initially telling you that there's a big discrepancy with the standard model, but then the data changed, and that brought the answer closer to the experiment. Now, Fodor's calculation without that data input was already close to the experiment. So, so Fodor would say, aha, I told you that there's no problem. But I think the problem is much more nuanced, that many Gladys QCD practitioners believe that Lattice QCD as a tool is not there yet to give that level of precision. And that the Fodor's case that he's close to the experiment is just a case of just serendipity that he happened to be 
the their closer. So it's a, it's an interesting ongoing story. I'm not an expert in it, but uh, that's my understanding of this issue. But yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think the even though Lasky City has many great successes, the G minus two people claim needs even more precision than Lattice has at the moment. And that's why it's the some people in the consortium think you have to include data from experiments to really make it a stronger comparison. Uh, while Fodor says, well, my lattice calculations are refined enough. I don't need the data. And this is OK. <laughs> this is the uh, okay. It's a. I mean, it's a, it's very impressive work. I mean, it's just a question of you know how things play out. Uh, going ahead. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, you say that works do not have any specs on uh, this uh, phenomenon, the need of the node, uh, exclusion principle or whatever. That's what explains it so. Yeah, so, so yeah, so what I'm talking about is really the universality between the gluon dominated regime of very early times where the quarks are a small correction, and that physics is we believe to be universal to that of cold atoms. So we don't understand what the quarks, how the quarks modify the picture, if at all. But that's an actually an interesting question whether one can engineer. So one way forward in the future is to do quantum computations. And quantum computations have the advantage that lattice skissity doesn't do is that they are done in real time. So unlike lattice skissity, which is an imaginary time, and so there are two ways to go ahead with quantum computation is you can either build a universal quantum computer, which is done just in terms of, you know, qubits instead of bits. And uh, it can apply to any problem, climate, lattice skissity, whatever, right? But then there's a different idea, which is whether you can use arrays of cold atoms to construct qubits from these atoms for specific problems of interest like which is designer so they're called analog quantum computers as opposed to digital quantum computers and so some of these results give us hope that we can use these cold atom arrays to construct hamiltonians like you were saying which are effective hamiltonians which capture the dynamics of QCD in some region. So the gluons we are seeing are behaving in such a way that we feel that, okay, there is a map to the dynamics of cold atoms, then it's not an unreasonable thing to, to engineer a cold atom Hamiltonian, which the system obeys, where then you can add additional elements, like you can add additional terms in terms of the interactions of cold atoms. So for example, I can inc include two cold atom vapors with different you know, spins, which could mimic the interactions they have quarks. And so this is then a kind of engineering that one can do, but then you can study the full quantum dynamics in real time of such a limited system. And so that's kind of one of the hopes. So one of the things that people have been able to do now in Heidelberg is that they've been able to generate actual plaquettes of this lattice using two cold atom vapors. So suppose you could construct the QCD gluon interactions, which are called plaquettes, using cold atoms, then you can really use that as a way to mimic the dynamics of. Uh, but quarks are always much more complicated to handle than just pure gluons, as we know even in lattice gauge theory. Um, so the little step for little feet. So let's just think about the gluon theory, and then the quarks are a very significant, important complication. Thank you. 